Thank you very much. These are my disclosures. So I'm gonna be covering toxicities of some commonly used drugs in complex patients, but rather than honing in on specific toxicities, I'm gonna be focusing on some broader principles. I'll consider overlapping toxicities and then think about how we can minimize and manage toxicity in complex patients. Warning, much of this content will sound blindingly obvious, but if my own clinic is an example, this doesn't mean the obvious always gets done. So these are some of the drugs we think of as fairly commonly used in complex patients. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna to touch on them very specifically, what I definitely won't be covering are Fostemzivir or Ibilizumab, because I can't say it. Uh, Fostemzivir has already been covered by Professor Chloe Orkin. And Ibilizumab is a drug I certainly don't have any experience of using. I think those who have it is limited. Now, we don't yet have it available in England. This is a summary of adverse reactions uh, from the summary of product characteristics. And I've put this in partly to illustrate that SPCs can be relatively unhelpful because they just list different side effects. But also, if you look towards the bottom, the numbers of patients on which it is based are relatively small. So this is a drug that we need to get more data on. However, its license and its route of administration mean I think it's always going to be a niche product. So first of all, some challenges. So the first challenge is if you look at trials in highly treated and experienced patients to perhaps get an idea of toxicity, you will see that discontinuation rates are higher than in earlier line studies. That's gonna be driven by, for example, background therapy. In treatment experience studies, a background therapy usually includes more drugs. And for people who have advanced HIV, they're more likely to be on other medications for other conditions. There's also the fact that people with advanced HIV are more likely to have symptomatic disease, which complicates the interpretation of side effects. As an example, Darunavir was studied in Power and Artemis. Power was in highly treatment experienced people and Artemis was in a first line trial population. And if we look at the discontinuations for adverse events in the Darunavir arms of these studies, it was 10% in Power and just 3% in Artemis. Now, Power used BD Darunavir. Artemis was once daily. That may account for some of that difference, but I think the main driver will be the background regimens. In Artemis, that was a simple 2-NRTI backbone of TDF and FTC, one that we know is relatively well tolerated. In Power, people took at least 2-NRTIs, but the time this was undertaken, that did not include a Bacavir or TDF, Therefore, it included the older and less well-tolerated NRTIs, plus the fact that almost half of the participants were taking T20, subcutaneous injection. The second set of challenges is adverse event reporting in trials can be unhelpful. So by simply listing the proportion of people who get a side effect over a one-year period is much less helpful than looking at the point prevalence and the incidence of new onset side effect over time, which I really think should be standard for all trials. Also, there's the fact that causality is subjective and it's subject to the bias of familiarity. So if it's a side effect that is already known to be associated with a drug, it's more likely to be deemed causal than if it's a side effect with which we're not familiar. I've already touched on summaries of product characteristics and they tend to just list everything, not necessarily in a very helpful way. The third challenge is that toxicities can overlap. And if someone's on multiple drugs, how do you decide which drug is the culprit? Now, you can look across the breadth of clinical trials. So if, for example, drug A is very uncommonly associated with a given side effect in the first line study, it's unlikely it's gonna be associated with that side effect in more complex combinations. What can help where it's feasible is very short-term interruptions of or substitutions of the drug you think may be responsible. And that can help identify whether it is responsible for the side effect and whether it's sensible or safe to continue it. Now I want to move on to some principles for managing toxicity. So the first is undertaking regular evidence review. 
Are there newer agents predicted to be as or even more active than the drug you think may be causing a toxicity? And actually, paradigms change. Does the patient who was thought to need a protease, an NNRTI, and an INSTI 10 years ago, do they need the same now? Or is there evidence to support we could give something simpler with fewer drugs? Principle two is around investigating side effects and being very certain that a drug is responsible. Now, if you've got a patient first or second line with multiple different drug options, it's very straightforward to try a switch or to try dropping a drug in order to decide if it's the causative problem or not. But where patients have few or no options, of course, we have less opportunity to experiment with antiretrovirals. So there, I think the threshold for investigating alternatives should be lower, i.e. you do tests before you blame the drug. Also, where a symptom has been fully investigated, we must really review carefully how and when because not all of the appropriate tests may have been undertaken and actually the tests may have evolved since the last screening for causes was undertaken. Let's take chronic diarrhea as an example. Warning, this isn't the first time I focus on diarrhea in this talk. So you may have someone and the medical notes say they had a full workup for diarrhea, but actually that could just mean they had some stool cultures and a colonoscopy 10 years ago. And if that's the case, we must revisit and look at novel causes. Using chronic diarrhea as an example, could it be irritable bowel syndrome? Could it be dietary? Caffeine, alcohol, and artificial sweeteners are all potential culprits of chronic diarrhea. Could it be inflammatory bowel disease? And the screening tests for that have become much simpler and more accurate. Could it be something like microscopic colitis, a condition that many people don't know much about? Could it be celiac disease? And again, the screening tests for this condition are simpler and more accurate. There's also the fact that many people don't get symptoms from, from celiac disease until their 40s or 50s. Could it be lactose intolerance? And could it be one of my favorites, pancreatic insufficiency, a diagnosis that can often be overlooked. We must remember our patients with very resistant virus who are treatment experienced have often been exposed to old drugs in the past that could contribute to pathologies like pancreatic insufficiency. And then finally, there's a fact that tests get better with time. So somebody who was thought to not have, for example, Giardia 5, 10 years ago, with more novel technologies such as PCR testing, it's worth repeating as they have a much better sensitivity than some of the older investigations. And of course, not to mention other drugs, this is a short list. There are papers looking at drug-associated diarrhea with lists of many, many more drugs than here. But these are just some of the commonly co-prescribed drug classes that can be associated with diarrhea. And this is another diagnosis that I love, bile acid diarrhea. And actually this is another paper, this one happens to be from the UK and just over 180 patients, but for people with quite severe functional or diarrhea predominant IBS symptoms, actually more than a third of them have bile acid diarrhea. It's a really underdiagnosed cause of chronic symptoms. And in fact, the recommendations from the authors of this paper is that primary bile acid diarrhea should be excluded in all patients with chronic diarrhea. And where that test is not available, it's quite a complex radio labeled assay that we should try empirical treatment with bile acid sequestrants. And actually they showed this diagnosis was particularly more likely in people who are overweight or obese. So a simple trial of a bile acid sequestrant may reveal that the symptoms are nothing to do with antiretrovirals at all. To add to the challenge, of course, etiology may evolve over time. So imagine you've diagnosed Giardia in somebody with a new or novel sensitive test. That can be associated with a post-Giardia lactose intolerance. So the same symptom may still exist thanks to a different cause. The other problem, and again, sticking to the diarrhea example, is that recall of gastrointestinal symptoms can be inaccurate. And indeed this paper, which looked at the accuracy of patient reported measures for gastrointestinal symptoms, showed that watery stools was one of the symptoms that people tended to overestimate quite markedly. And here, detailed symptom diaries can be invaluable. 
Principle three is about being as certain about toxicity causation as we can. Now, an example of this is renal impairment. And this diagram illustrates one of my favorite sayings, which is to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And where we talk about this a lot in our meetings locally is where someone with renal impairment shows no improvement in their renal impairment on stopping tenofovir, for example, then we must make it very clear in the medical notes that that drug is still an option. Perhaps another good example would be darunavir rash. And if you've got somebody who really does need darunavir in their regimen for it to be effective, but has a history of rash. Now, the first thing is to take an accurate history. What was the severity? Were there any other concomitant medications or illnesses that could have accounted for the symptoms? Skin patch testing is something we undertake on occasion to decide if there truly is an allergy or not, and most immunology services can offer this. Then also there is the option to just try a controlled re-challenge, depending on the severity of the previous rash, depending on skin patch testing or not. And of course, if the previous rash had been severe, you might want to undertake that in an inpatient environment. But ultimately, if you really need a drug where someone has got a definite allergy, you can use desensitization. Now, this is very well established for penicillin, for example. There are two published case reports of undertaking desensitization for amprenovir and darunavir so that it could be used in patients who really needed that drug in their regimen. Principle four of managing rather than avoiding toxicity. Now, again, in people who are on their first line regimen, if a drug causes a side effect, you can switch to something else. But where you really need that drug and there's no reasonable alternative, we need to accept that we may have to support the patient to live with that symptom. So where a drug has clear benefits, the threshold for acceptable toxicity is higher. And here actually I've drawn an example from another disease area. So ACE inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blockers for patients with diabetes, hypertension and albuminuria, the benefit of these drugs is very clearly established. So you want a high threshold for stopping them. So this comes from the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Guidelines, which were updated this year and published only last month. But what they recommend now is you must continue these drug classes. These can be associated with new onset renal impairment, but unless the serum creatinine rises by more than 30%, you should continue them. Now, back when I was a junior doctor prescribing these drugs, a much less than 30% rise in creatinine would have triggered a stopping them. And this is an example of where, as the evidence has evolved to really demonstrate marked benefit, the threshold for stopping the drug has gone up. Now, managing symptoms, and again, I'm gonna use diarrhea as an example, you may need to try many different treatments in order to see an effect. Because for example, protease inhibitor related diarrhea, we don't fully understand the mechanism. So you may need to try different agents, anti-motility agents, bulking agents, in order to see which is most effective. However, if you're trying different treatments, you need to give enough time for them to work. So for example, if somebody has IBS type symptoms, chronic diarrhea, it's worth trying probiotics, but you need to give them at least four weeks before you decide whether they're effective or not. You also have to set, if you're looking back into the literature to help you, some of this literature is not very new. So the paper that um, led to the examples I've listed in point one was actually published 20 years ago, but that doesn't mean it's not helpful. And the other thing that I'd really like to emphasize is the value of peer support. Now here in the UK, we've got really good national standards for peer support in HIV. And I think the value of peer support for people living with HIV is well established but peer support is shown to be helpful for other long-term symptoms. So people with diabetes, people with irritable bowel syndrome, and people with chronic pain, there is good evidence that peer support can be helpful. And it may be that for somebody, for example, living with quite disabling gastrointestinal symptoms, that putting them in touch with a different peer support group outside of the sphere of HIV may help them gain some important information and support about managing their symptoms well. And the final thing to emphasize is there is, of course, a lot of overlap and interplay between physical and mental health. 
Mental health can affect people's ability to cope with physical symptoms. Physical symptoms can make people depressed. And making sure we understand that, for example, depression in people with multimorbidity, which is going to apply to a lot of our patients with very um, advanced HIV or limited treatment options, making sure their mental health is optimised to help them cope with physical symptoms is really important. And again, that's something that needs to be reviewed over time. If somebody wasn't depressed two years ago, it does not mean they're not depressed now. So regular screening and appropriate referral pathways are essential. So to conclude, if antiretroviral choice is limited, toxicity may have to be tolerated. But through continuous review of treatment options, including new drugs and, of course, clinical trials for HIV, continuous review of the impact of symptoms on patients' activities of daily living, their quality of life, and importantly, their adherence, but also continuous review of diagnostic and therapeutic advances for the symptom in question can all help managing that toxicity better. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for your attention and those are my contact details.